really important if you're going to accelerate. Now, Mark Chasen is going to talk to us about all of, well, not all, but a huge number of, of innovation opportunities and business development opportunities. Mark Chasen has, unfortunately, a very short biography. It goes, uh, it goes something like this. He's a regenerative whole systems futurist, strategic advisor, mentor, and eco-social entrepreneur. That's a, that's a big mouthful. It basically means he does really good, complicated, sophisticated things in those, world, in those worlds. Been a lawyer for years, been a, a, an executive in several businesses and startups with successful exits, which of course is very important. important. Passionate about renewable energy, et cetera. Um, Mark, frankly, you're, you're, if I keep going on your bio, you won't get to your presentation. So with no, with no further delay, Mark Jason, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Christopher. Such a pleasure to be here. And thank you all for attending. And my hope is that uh, at the end of my presentation, you leave inspired and that I've given some new thought and consideration for those in innovation, whether it be uh, corporate executives looking for an advantage, uh, whether it be uh, marketing people, whether who are looking to build a brand, whether it be uh, consultants, finance people, um, anybody really in, in our day and age can benefit from the massive changes that are happening in innovation and technology. Um, and as an overview, um, when, you, when we think about things like RPA, IA, AI, robotics, and even what I'm going to be talking about is regenerative technologies, we often think of them as an industry or a market or a vertical. And really, all of these things are, are what I call horizontals. They go across all industries, and all industries are being affected and transformed uh, in today's world. And really, the theme of this is, if you don't want to compete, innovate. Um, if you are doing the same old thing that everybody else is doing, well, sometimes you can have a great deal of success because the market is growing fast enough and big enough where the, the demand of the market is just not actually satisfied by the <clears throat> um, types of businesses that you are doing along with everybody else. But even within that, um, if you really want to hold market share, if you want to do really great things as a company, uh, it's so important that you innovate and differentiate and look at really what is the purpose for my company to exist? Why are we here? Are we here just to make money? Are we here to make the world a better place? Are we here to increase the quality of life? And hopefully, um, it, it is all those things. So, um, as uh, Ed Freeman said, corporations, um, <clears throat> or I need red blood cells to stay alive, but it's not my purpose in life. Corporations need profits, but they need to realize that it's not their purpose. So, on with the presentation. And again, thank you for being here. So, what is innovation? We often talk about uh, what innovation is. Um, and I would say, you know, if, if you look at a traditional Merriam Webster definition, uh, it is defined as a new idea, device, or method. Um, and or the act of or process of introducing new ideas, devices, or methods. However, that's kind of broad and it really doesn't get us down to the execution and implementation of innovation or why we're doing it. So I would like to propose that innovation is the ideation, development, implementation, and execution of novel solutions that address needs, desires, and challenges through inventions, methods, products, and services. So we can think and ideate all day long, but if we don't develop, implement, and execute, our, our, our innovation is really um, not ever going to get off the ground. Also, many people innovate just for the sake of innovation, and it really doesn't address any desires, needs, or challenges of the market. So as we go through our 
ideation and thought about how we innovate, the, the massive amounts of brain power effort it takes to get a product, especially an innovative product off the shelf and into the market. It's really important that we think about what we're doing, what our purpose is and what we're addressing. One of the things that we often see is we innovate and we come up with things and technologies that are often very destructive. And we're seeing that in pollution, toxicity, uh, war, and many of those sorts of things. And you know, these uh, there's a, there's a lot that we've done with innovation that's gone wrong. Uh, greenhouse gases and climate disasters, destructive agricultural practices, commercial overfishing and destruction, weaponized nanotechnology, bio and nuclear weapons, waste and pollution, product obsolesc uh, obsolescence and overconsumption. We actually make products that will have a limited lifetime and fail leading to more waste and more consumption. Uh, cyber terrorism, hunger, disease, poverty, dirty fuels and energy, toxic chemicals and destruction of ecosystems, inefficient congested and healthy cities, weaponized robots and drones, invasive surveillance and extractive industries. So, you know, is this the world we're going to create or are we gonna look at, hmm, every time we have challenges, amazing and massive opportunities arrive. And these are some, some really, really big challenges. And in this presentation, we're going to talk about some of the opportunities uh, that are so needed to increase quality of life and health of people and planet. And those include such, th such things as healthy ecosystems, clean air, pure water, nutritious and healthy food, reduced climate disasters, biomedic and renewable materials, ethical AI and robotics, applied personalized learning, zero waste, supply chain efficiency, clean and renewable energy, circular manufacturing, localized and efficient supply chain, wise regenerative and resilient cities, and regenerative land, water, and ocean management, and IoT for natural resource efficiency. Um, and interestingly enough, one of the things that we listed here was why is regenerative and resilient cities rather than smart cities which many of us have heard about where you know we are using rpa we are using ia we are using ai we are using robotics but in many ways it's to create cities for electrons greater efficiency but we're not really thinking about uh, how humans need nature how what humans need to thrive, what nature needs to thrive. And that's why going beyond the smart cities to wise regenerative and resilient cities, we're talking about massive opportunities. Intel estimates IoT alone for uh, the uh, <clears throat> um, smart cities infrastructure is a $41 trillion opportunity over the next 20 years. Um, so yes, there's lots of money here, but we also have an ability to do it better now. So one of the big drivers of innovation nowadays is realizing that we have used technology uh, in a way that has caused massive damage to our environment as shared in that previous slide. And there's a lot of money flowing into what's called ESG and regenerative applications. Um, so these are things like, like green bonds, and we will talk specifically about some of the technologies that, that actually qualify as ESG, or environmental, social, and governance. Um, currently, globally, there are four, there's $40.5 trillion of assets under management for ESG companies. And largely, um, I would say that regenerative uh, is a, an umbrella that includes sustainability and circularity. So regenerative technologies and opportunities include those that add value, renewal, and vitality to our ecosystem, or a system 
It could be a corporate system. It could be um, a, a, a farm. It could be a garden. It could be the oceans. It could be your family unit. How do you continually add value and renew? Sustainability is a philosophy of do no harm. Um, and so rather than doing further harm, we, we attempt to sustain and the harm we've done and mitigate the damage uh, that we've done to the environment. But quite frankly, sustainability is a slower way to die, yet it's still important. So for example, one of my companies is a seaweed company that does both sustainable wild harvesting and regenerative cultivation. So the sustainable wild har harvesting actually stewards the kelp beds and helps them grow back more healthy it increases biodiversity and the health of the ocean, but it's the cultivation that is actually adding new environments, new ecosystems, new carbon sequestration. So I just wanted to raise that as a way of distinction. And circularity is primarily a way of eliminating waste in the design and manufacturing processes so that as we, <clears throat> as we manufacture and distribute in that supply chain cycle, from supply to the consumer, we have eliminated pretty much all the waste and pollution through reuse, repurposing, recycling, remanufacturing, and upcycling of materials. I refer to this, this new opportunity as the regenerative economy. And here are some of the opportunities uh, in it, the regenerative economy. And we will go into defining some of the uh, actual markets, some examples of these markets, but it's really, these are some of the largest opportunities right now in the world. And it isn't only for uh, RPA or IA or AI um, or robotics. Again, these are, these are opportunities that go across many industries. So we're looking at food, agriculture, mariculture, and ag tech. And ag tech is um, are things like drones, robotics, using sensoring, monitoring to be able to uh, track what is actually happening in a land, a jungle or forest, whether it be water, how natural the sunshine, uh, the growth of plants and trees, um, and water and, and aquatech. So how we treat our water, is there a better way of, of handling water so that we're recycling it and sending it to industry? Um, are we purifying it without uh, harsh chemicals like chlorine and fluorides? Um, how are we treating this resource that really is life itself in a way that is respectful and that we are using it efficiently and in a way that actually promotes the health of people and planet? Uh, of course, we have renewable energies and energy and fuel. We have IoT for natural capital and resources, and this could be anything from IoT and how we can uh, do circularity in manufacturing, um, how we can use sensors, monitors, and information to run our cities more effectively and uh, increase quality of life, and look at some of the potential intangibles uh, we tend to be very focused on GDP, whereas Bhutan started something called the Gross Happiness Index. And so how do we look at, at the quality of life in our cities uh, from you know, tracking the health and disease of, of people, crimes, education, um, emotional intelligence, uh, ways that people actually get along, community projects, things like that. And yes, IoT can be used for all those things. And that really also is a, a fundamental uh, transformational technology inside of our wise, regenerative and resilient cities that actually move uh, technology um, for farming and agriculture and supply chain into our cities that we make our cities more beautiful, that our buildings become carbon, sink carbon sinks, that uh, health and wellness becomes part of the fabric of a city. So next we have bioenergetic soil and water remediation. Uh, currently the way that we 
um, remediate our soil and water from contaminants is largely through chemical and mechanical processes. Yet the earth over four and a half billion years has shown us how we can actually use um, the earth's technology. This is called biomimicry. Uh, the, the, the years of systems wisdom that the earth has to energetically and biologically provide for soil and water remediation. This can be using um, light. This can be using sound. This can be using molecular frequencies, mycelium, which is the, the mushrooms, uh, bacteria, to clean up just about any type of contamination. We also have big data for human and planetary health. Uh, the massive amount of data in healthcare, biotech, uh, managing ecosystems, uh, valuing and uh, monitoring carbon sequestration and the massive uh, climate change and carbon markets, 3D printing, which allows for uh, much more effective and local manufacturing of goods, uh, biomimetic materials and bio-inspired design. Uh, this is a really fascinating area. And uh, some examples include a company that uh, took a hemp polymer rather than digging up iron ore uh, in Africa, putting it upon a freighter burning bunker fuel to China, it burns coal to smelt it into steel and roll it into rebar, putting it back on a bunker, then putting it on trucks delivered to the job site. Uh, they were able to take a renewable material, hemp, pull a polymer out of it and use spider silk biomimicry to create a rebar that was that's stronger and lighter than steel. Uh, another example includes uh, the Galapagos shark skin. A company was looking at how to uh, reduce staph infections at hospitals, and they realized that the Galapagos shark skin doesn't get any bacteria. So they made a wallpaper that mimicked the pattern of the shark skin, and they cut down staph infections by 50% in the hospitals that use their wall with their wallpaper. Uh, climate change is an existential crisis, and we often think that if we reduce carbon um, and do carbon credits, that somehow will magically uh, heal our ecosystems. While carbon credits are a step in the right direction, there are plenty of greenhouse gases. Uh, that actually have much greater greenhouse gas effects, such as methane. But it doesn't address the real issues like, why don't we have oxygen credits or biodiversity credits? Because what we really have to do is heal and cause our ecosystems to thrive. And that is really what, you know, is, is truly the work that may save us from the sixth mass extinction. Uh, we also have biotech biotech, genomics, and healthcare. Uh, massive, massive multi-trillion dollar opportunities to actually unlock the gene sequences and the way that microbes work within our, uh, our world. And rather than trying to uh, wage war against the next pandemic, we can focus on actually creating healthy immune systems and a symbiotic or even a mutualistic relationship with bacteria and virus. Of course, this goes into optimal wellness and nanotechnology is another great opportunity. Uh, <clears throat> in the world of nanotechnology, we've, we've created technologies and materials that can actually form themselves, heal themselves through these nanobots. Uh, however, if we make materials that can never be recycled, uh, that never can be destroyed, we often have uh, a, a potential for causing great, great damage. Um, one, one company that uh, I worked with uh, found a way of taking cyanobacteria and programming it to release uh, butanol rather than carbohydrates. And luckily they took a 12 step biosafety um, mechanism that allowed that actually prevented the cyanobacteria from, from uh, reproducing in nature. Yet there are others that are playing in this space that actually don't have those biosafety mechanisms in place. So 
we have to be very careful again about how we innovate. Um, we're also seeing a multi-trillion dollar opportunity in fintech and new blockchain technologies. And um, blockchain is primarily a, a smart ledger that allows <coughs> for transparency of transactions and allows transactions to occur without human intervention in a trustless environment which means that if all of the components are in place, the transaction gets executed and it's transparent for everyone to see. This actually could be something that helps reduce and mitigate a lot of corruption and leakage that we see in, in nonprofits, government supply chain, et cetera. Um, the other thing we're seeing is, is uh, gamification, VR. How can VR be used to heal and to teach us? And how can we get people in within the game uh, incentives to go out in the real world and do real world good? Uh, clean and renewable energy, that includes solar, wind, geothermal, hydro, micro hydro, tidal. Um, there's so much energy on this planet that can be tapped in natural ways, but the big challenge right now is a portable fuel and one that can be stored and used and that's why hydrogen is taking a big lead here however if we have to burn coal to get the hydrogen it doesn't make a lot of sense so there's a lot of new tech in how we can create green hydrogen um, and finally you know we're talking about ro robotics and this is applied to agriculture how can we how can we feed the world how can we return the soil to health how can that soil become a, a, a carbon sink? Um, how do we actually, uh, you know, get into the extractive industries with robotics and do less harm to the planet while replacing hazardous jobs? So these are just a few of the things that um, are such huge opportunities. And, you know, for entrepreneurs all the way up to some of, you know, the Fortune 500, everybody is starting to think about these opportunities and how they can embrace them to not only make money but also to make the world a better place and here are a couple of examples of of the market sizes of some of these opportunities in uh, regenerative innovation so for example smart cities uh, is anticipated to be a two and a half trillion dollar market by 2026 Clean tech and climate uh, is anticipated to be four trillion dollars by 2024. NGFS uh, net zero by 2050 is a 275 trillion dollar capital allocation um, between 2021 and 2050. Uh, how do we eliminate waste according to various UN uh, and protocol standards? Biomimetic materials, which we just discussed, is a $425 billion industry by 2030. Uh, ESG, as we mentioned, is um, currently got $40.5 trillion of assets under management, and it's on track to hit $53 trillion by 2025. Sustainable and green bonds, in other words, bonds that actually finance these improvements in ESG and sustainability in oceans is um, <clears throat> predicted to be 1.3 trillion by 2022 and the restoration economy in other words healing the damage we've done is a one trillion dollar uh, opportunity so as you can see here uh, there are massive amounts of money to be made in doing regenerative innovation and when you compare that to a current $80 trillion per year uh, GDP um, and natural capital, in other words, the assets and ecosystem services of nature are valued at $125 trillion per year, which actually dwarfs our economy. And quite frankly, if it weren't for natural capital, we would have no economy and we wouldn't be alive. So preserving that natural capital is a massive opportunity. Um, since we're here talking about RPA, IA, AI, and robotics, um, you know, these are also massive opportunities with a lot of growth. As you can see, RPA is going from 2.1 billion in 2021 to 13.4 billion in 2030. 
I mean, that's that's incredible growth. Um, and we're seeing, you know, in all in all of these markets, uh, often, you know, double digit to middle du double digit CAGRs. Uh, IA is an eight and a half billion dollar market as of 2020, uh, set to reach 21.6 billion by 2028. Uh, AI, however, is seeing massive growth at 93.5 billion in 2021, moving to 997.8 billion in 2028, and robotics going from 12.2 billion in 2020 to 149.9 billion in 2030. So, as you can see, you know, these technologies are going to see incredible growth. But then again, compared to the regenerative technologies and opportunities and $125 trillion a year of natural capital to actually uh, preserve, heal, and regenerate, um, you know, the, the, the market for that is as big as it, as it gets. So here are some other markets that um, are also uh, what I would consider you know, somewhat horizontals. Uh, click to call. Uh, as I was doing my research, I, didn't need, I, I had no idea that this industry of how we use our computers and our smartphones to click to make a call is going to reach 47 trillion by 2027. It's like, Oh my God, who would have thought? Uh, virtual assistants and chatbots, as annoying as they may be, will be a $33 billion market by 2020, 2028. And they actually are getting smarter and smarter all the time until I'm sure at some point in the next 20 years, we'll have a singularity where those virtual assistants and chatbots will act just like humans. And you probably won't be able to tell the difference. Uh, video surveillance is is key to security, but also to efficiency. And you know, there's a whole other area, which is uh, which is image and optical character recognition, so that machines actually know what they are survey surveilling, um, and how best to interact with other machines to find the the best results to increase security, safety, and quality of life. Uh, information security, of course, uh, being that there's so much data sitting on so many computers nowadays uh, that uh, how do we keep that information safe and secure and prevent it from succumbing to cyber attack? Oh, that's a $175 billion market opportunity by 2024. Uh, blockchain technology uh, is said to be a $1.4 trillion industry by 2030. Um, and the metaverse, uh, as you know, uh, Facebook changed its name to Meta, and the idea of using virtual worlds and AI to accomplish greater interaction and obtain uh, information to set up marketplaces is going to be seeing explosive growth uh, by 2028, going to 828.9 billion. And finally, autonomous vehicles. Uh, are currently 45.3 billion, but are looking at going to 160.7 billion by 2028. So a lot of folks work inside of corporations who have for many years used hierarchical structures. Um, there's, there's a lot of bureaucracy. Uh, uh, there are cultures of fear and blaming and shaming and budgets being used and, and resources being used in ways that are highly inefficient. Um, and then you wonder why some of the largest corporations in the world are the least innovative. And so, I mean, of course you do have tech companies, you know, such as Google and Microsoft and Amazon that are pushing the frontiers of, of technology and uh, delivery and supply chain and autonomous vehicles, etc. But how do you actually create uh, a company that fosters innovation? So here are 10 effective ways that that can be done. And I'm happy to help and drill down further into these uh, offline. Uh, but first of all, you have to create a culture of innovation and inspiration. 
you know, how, how do you allow people to, to dream? How do you inspire them through, through fun and through learning, through teamwork to be able to say, I have a great idea. And rather than getting shut down, saying, wonderful, we love ideas. And here are all the other wonderful ideas. And here's maybe some other people that, that have thought of, of things. Why don't you join their team and go work on this? But to really take that passion for innovation, for creation, for novelty, and to foster it. Um, and, you know, we live in a universe of infinite possibilities, yet so often uh, in the workplace, it, everything always has to make economic sense. Um, and sometimes some of the biggest things at the time they were, they were uh, developed and put into the market really didn't make economic sense. I mean, think about how many internet companies really didn't make economic sense when they started. Um, and you look at companies, for instance, like Netflix, which is pretty much on everybody's TV, but yet they have, they have yet to turn a profit. Of course, there is an economic model that eventually they will make a profit, uh, but they're continuing to invest in their growth and their catalog so that they can, in fact, dominate a market. Um, and then so often uh, the tools, the budgets, the support uh, for innovation are, um, are just not there. You can't expect uh, a, uh, a software developer or an app developer to develop their apps on equipment that is, is old and doesn't have the compute necessary. Uh, you can't expect a chemist to you know, devote themselves to innovations in chemistry if they don't even have a, a, an up-to-date lab. So it's really important to provide the right tools. Um, you know, the other thing is, is you have to have courage to take risks and innovation can be risky, but you have to have courage and belief in achievement, not only at the personal level, but as a, as a culture. Um, and part of that is to promote experimentation and continual improvement. In other words, rather than you made a mistake, we're gonna point fingers at you and shame you and you're not getting your bonus, it's like, Oh, well, what did you learn from that? Is there some, you know, Edison did uh, 10,000 filaments before uh, he finally found one that worked. And when he was being interviewed, they said, how could you possibly fail 10,000 times? And he says, I didn't fail. I learned what not to do 10,000 times. So we wouldn't even have a light bulb if we <laughs> actually ran innovation like so many uh, corporations do. Um, you have to build integrated multidisciplinary teams. If we're building a product that the market won't buy or doesn't address a, pro uh, a problem or just innovating for innovation's sake, often um, you know, we, we find that that innovation never gets implemented uh, or fulfilled to the market because there is no market. So it's really important to have uh, multidisciplinary teams that can develop the product, that can do the ideation, that can can determine where the market is, who the target customer is, make a case to the CFO that you know there there really should be funding put behind the innovation, um, you know, and we have to create a, a, a supportive space for creativity, and this goes back not only to not blaming, but how can people openly share ideas and and not be judged if they have a wacky idea because. Sometimes it's the wacky ideas that are the ones that, that make the greatest impact in the world. And, you know, again, as I said, you know, define the market. Uh, who, who are we serving and, and how big is that market and how, how fast growing is it and how much, how do we balance our needs for profits along with our innovation? Um, also, we have to change the way that organizations are structured. This hierarchical bureaucratic organization doesn't lend itself to innovation and entrepreneurship. And rather, I pose that we use situationally adaptive organizations where authority is not given by title, but actually by uh, expertise. And that as situations dictate, the organization can, can change and be flexible and nimble in a, in a rapidly moving innovation and technology environment. And finally, 
uh, when you do have ideas that you have a market for that you think solve a real need, uh, a desire or challenge in the market, then rapid prototype, check it out, uh, come up with your MVP. Once that works, QC it, deploy it, and get the financial support behind it. Oops. Um, well, a slide was missed here, um, which was a nice quote, but uh, anyhow, we can uh, just say that the last slide said, if you don't want to compete, innovate. And basically it was the crazy ones quote um, that, that Apple used. Here's to the crazy ones, the square pegs and the round holes, the ones who change, who think they can change the world often do. And so thank you so much for joining this presentation. Uh, much appreciated. I hope uh, that through this presentation, I opened some uh, new possibilities and ways of looking at the world, seeing opportunities, and how we use innovation to actually improve quality of life and ecosystemic thriving. Thank you so much. And here is my contact. I feel free to get in touch with me if you have any further information you desire. Mark, I've, have you got time for a couple of questions? Yeah, if you got time. Fantastic. Uh, okay. Yeah, we do. We got, a couple, we got some time. Um, I, right, I, so, so let me ask you this. I can't see you. I stopped sharing the presentation. What okay. do I need to do to start to see you? Um, let's see, where are you? I still see your presentation. So you probably stopped sharing. Um, Brian, if you're there, if you can hear, I'm not sure what the what the technical issue is, but I can still see the thank you slide. Yes. Uh, hi guys, I am here. Um, let me just check, Mark. Um, on your uh, presentation, um, let me just do this. It might change it. So I'm going to bear with. I can see me. I can see Mark. Mark, are you there? Can you yeah, see me? I, I'm here, but I can't see you. All I see is my presentation screen. Okay. Uh, okay. How about now? Uh, still can't see you, but let's go ahead with the questions. Yeah, let's do it anyway. Here's, here's the question. It's a kind of a transition point because when I listen to everything you say, and you and I have not met before, but when I listen to everything you say, and we're talking about intelligent automation, RPA, et cetera, that can be a very inward focused thing right within a business they can be thinking what can i automate what can i put intelligent automation around um, and it can, can consume a lot of time of a lot of people but what i'd like and I'm, I'm leading you here is really what i'm saying is that if we do rpa if we do intelligent automation and suddenly we find out 30 percent of the people we used to have doing all this stuff that was wasting their time are available mm -hmm that one of the big sources to execute on some of that great innovation you just laid out? These people who were so busy with their heads down now can lift their heads up and start to think about those fantastic innovations. Does that make sense to you? Does that resonate? Oh yeah, it absolutely does. And a lot of people are very scared when it comes to having their job replaced with AI and bots and, and robotics. Um, so my, my sense is here that there will be a lot of repurposing and and you know we we we've tried depending on who the administration is from time to time to take the coal miners out of the coal mines which is a horribly hazardous job uh you know creates all kinds of health issues and and you know cancer and lung disease and it, it's just horrible well bots could do that and we just retrain them to you know to get into construction to do infrastructure for cities for you know solar energy or or hydro or or geothermal or hydro i mean there's so many other jobs that we need and can repurpose these these people to do once the hazardous and menial jobs are replaced with robots you know i, I always used to say innovation only starts when someone feels safe enough to innovate right if wow. you go into a room with 10 people and say come up with an innovation that only needs six of you it ain't gonna happen <laughs> right? yeah. but if you say we have all this great stuff we need people to do can you guys figure out how to free up some of your people to be able to do that magically doors open 
right? Yep. And people, because they know where they're going, they know where they're jumping. I think it's probably true with the coal miners too. They don't know where they're going to go, so they're they're. You know, yeah, I kind of call it Tarzan economics. Sometimes, you know, you're you're clinging to this vine, it's duct taped, and it's about to break, and you're going to hit the jungle floor. But you know, if there's some momentum, you sometimes you just have to go and reach out for that next vine and and take a shot. And so we're we're sort of at this place where we have so many existential threats from our industrial age innovation that now you know we've destroyed the house. Let's go rebuild it. And so, that, you know, and we're going to make way more money rebuilding our house than we did destroying it. Yeah, I, I hear I hear a huge just element of hope in what you're talking about. Right. And that's if other people from, you know, from your perspective, you're out there investing, you know, money's obviously not an issue for you. You're and I don't mean to dig into your banking account, but that some of these coal miners are terrified. Yeah, let me put that up on screen. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Well, look, uh, we're we're running out of time here, uh, but I, I think you've made a very gracious offer to make your contact details available to people. Um, is that the best way for people to reach out to find out more about what you're doing? I think you whetted a lot of appetites on some very interesting subjects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would just say that probably um, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. That's probably one of the best ways to connect uh, because I have some pretty extensive filters on my on my inbox, but I did give that inbox uh, the, the, the mark at transformativecapital.com email, and you can feel free to contact me there as well. Um, and so, and, and also I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn and then explore how I might be able to help you as, as a entrepreneur, as a consultant, as a, you know, as a, as a, uh, corporation looking to grab more market share and do good in the world with innovation. I do put a pretty heavy filter on it, which is that um, for me to be involved, I really wanted to have eco-social impact. That, that's a great call to action for anybody on the phone listening to you. And there, there's a subset of people today on the phone, but this information will be distributed to thousands of people. You better you better tighten up that filter a little bit just in case. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. We're going to give everybody a few minute break here before we go into the next session. For anybody who is still on the phone, uh, that next session is Jesse Tut. He's going to talk to us about all this stuff we're talking about in the healthcare space. So please log back on at the top of the hour. And Mark, again, given your resume and what you're doing right now, thank you for taking the time to talk to all of us who are watching you now and who will watch you over the next several months. Well, thank you, Christopher and Brian, and the rest of the team, and all of those that participated, uh, much appreciated. And hope to, hope, to, uh, hope to make a difference in the world. So- yeah, you're doing together. it. That's thank fantastic. You. Thanks, Mark. Take care. Bye-bye.